Welcome to Pilgrim Lost. Come walk with us while we explore life in hopeful motion. All right, it's Pilgrim Lost. We are here um, today. I'm I'm really excited about this. This is this is a fellow that I've known for a while, loosely. Um, we've got a, some mutual friends, um, really dynamic, interesting human being who's doing his part to change the world. And just recently, we sort of gotten reacquainted and started to become friends. I think on a deeper level, which is a huge gift in my life. Uh, his name is Jeremy Valorant. This is Jeremy. Jeremy, I'm just going to introduce you just a little bit. All right. He is the president and CEO of Rescue Freedom International, which is an abolitionist organization. Um, Rescue Freedom International, I mean, the coolest name ever, can I just say? Um, uh, whatever I can do to get business cards, say Rescue Freedom International, I'm totally in. I want to be able All to right. hand it out All right. I walk around in the world. And then he is also the co-founder of Climb for Captives, climbforcaptives.com. Yep. Uh, which is a philanthropic adventure organization. And um, um, well, I'm looking to talk to you about both those things. Jeremy, welcome to the community. Thanks for getting lost with us. Oh, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. So cool. Uh, first of all, um, let's let's talk a little about Rescue Freedom. Let's start there. Oh, uh, by the way, Jeremy's a husband and a father and a neighbor and a community member. I mean, he doesn't just change the world. He like he he's got I like changed diapers too. Although actually, it's been a few years since I changed diapers. So. Um, uh, as far as getting into being becoming an abolition uh, abolitionist, um, that's not something that happens overnight. And you started Rescue Freedom International. I know you you had you had a few endeavors before that. We were trying to get into sort of being personally involved in global slavery. Um, and then you start it. So maybe let's do this. Could you just briefly tell us what is rescue freedom? And what I really want to know is how the heart of a middle class white kid in uh, in America got fell in love with this issue, and where your passions were so much you wanted to dedicate your life to this. So those are the two things I'd like you to address, please. All right. Well, yeah. So Rescue Freedom, uh, the short version of, of who we are and what we do is we're fighting human trafficking, specifically sex trafficking around the world. Um, that's an issue that unfortunately is, is one of the fastest growing criminal enterprises on the planet in the world today. Uh, mm -hmm. The second largest global issue after the drug trade. Um, so it's it's this massive issue. And we believe that this is a man-made problem. Uh, this is not, you know, this is not a mystery virus that's perpetrated by, you know, forces of biology or mosquitoes, you know, perpetuating malaria. This, this issue only exists because human beings choose to wake up each day and to exploit other human beings. And wow. because it's a man-made problem, we believe there can be man-made solutions. Um, there's no mystery to why this issue exists. And so we believe we can do something about it. Um, so we exist to, to combat human trafficking and, and sexual exploitation around the world. And my journey started, uh, as you mentioned, uh, kind of not how I expected it, uh, not what I thought I'd be doing. I, I grew up in a small town in the foothills of the Cascade Mountains, about 45 minutes from Seattle, uh, logging in Dairy Town. Uh, and I loved my, my small town e existence. Um, and But I was, I was kind of determined to see the world. So right after I graduated high school, school, I, I found the cheapest way to spend a year in Europe and moved to Europe for a while and, and kind of hopped around studying in different countries. And um, along the way, I met this this mentor who um, had grown up as a as a kid. His parents were educators in India. And so he had grown up there. And and this was before I was married, before I had kids. And at one point he invited me on a trip to India. He just wanted to go and retrace his childhood steps and he was in his in his 60s at the time, and his wife hates to fly, and that's a very long flight uh, if you've ever flown to India. There's no fast way there, and so she didn't want to go. And so he said, hey, will you be my wingman? And so I was in my early 20s, and he was in his early 60s, and we went and traveled around together. And at the tail end of the trip, he said, you know, I have these friends. I haven't seen them in a, in a couple decades. I think it was the last time he had been up there. He said, but, you know, they've been rescuing kids out of brothels, and I've always wanted to go and see the work. And honestly, my first reaction was, wait, what? You're like rescuing kids out. I mean, it was nowhere on my radar screen. 
And, and so he's like, do you mind if we just tell him we'll give him our last day? We fly, we'll fly up into Mumbai in the evening and then we fly out the next night. So we'll have about 24 hours in the city and they offered to host us. And so let's go. And so they picked us up and they drove us on like a Friday night into what at the time was the largest red light district in the world, uh, a place called Kamatapura in Mumbai that was at its peak estimated to be about 50,000 women and children in sexual exploitation in about 11 square blocks. So for me, I mean, that was, uh, that was uh, roughly like 10 to 12 times the size of my hometown. And so trying to wrap my head around 50,000 people in exploitation was beyond imagination. And it was, mm -hmm. this was not a glamorous, like, we're appealing to tourists. We're trying to allure, you know, people to come here for, for some kind of sex tourism or something. This was very poor. At, at that point, Mumbai was booming and there were about 8 million men who were migrant workers who would come into the city for about eight months a year and be sort of day laborers on all the construction projects. And then they'd go back to the villages. And so this was a red light district that was set up to serve these sort of day wage workers. And it was just rampant exploitation. And honestly, for me, as a as a kid who had never seen that kind of poverty or exploitation, it just broke my heart. And I was discouraged. And honestly, it was kind of like, why, why, are, why are we here? Like, why did we need to see this? I just want to go home. I don't feel like I can do anything about it. And they said, no, you got to you got to see the other side. And so then they took us a couple hours outside the city and took us to a series of safe houses. The first home, they said, this is a home for kids under the age of 12 who are getting specialized medical treatment. Most of them are HIV positive, all from those those brothels. Um, and again, I was like, I, I don't know that I want to see this, that that sounds super discouraging and heavy, and I don't have anything to offer these kids. And when we walked in, I remember as we approached the front door, I could hear the kids laughing and singing and playing. And it just sounded like a bunch of kids running around having fun. And we went in and spent a couple hours just playing with these kids and singing and dancing and playing the you know Indian version of Duck, Duck, Goose. And... And I just knew, I, honestly, my first reaction was, if there's this kind of hope after that kind of darkness, I have to be a part of it. I don't know what that yeah. means. I don't know what it looks like. Yeah. But if these kids can have this kind of hope after that kind of darkness, that's something worth fighting for. Um, yeah. And so we got to visit a few other homes. And that was sort of the sentiment of, for me, I mean, I, I had grown up in a, in a context of faith that had these big themes like redemption or restoration, or we could sing a song like Amazing Grace, I was blind, but now I see. But I grew up in a pretty happy little quiet farm town where there didn't seem to be a lot of pain and suffering. And so I think I'm in my mind, I believe like, oh, yeah, that, you know, you could be blind and see or there's you can have hope after darkness. But when I saw the red light area, I thought, like, honestly, I don't think there's hope after this. And so when I saw, you know, when I, with some of the, the college age young girls who were going to college around the same age as I was pursuing their dreams, becoming teachers and accountants. And I was just so blown away that, man, if, if, if this really is possible to have a life and a future and hope after such horrific exploitation, how can I not not join in? So so that was kind of what grabbed my heart and kickstarted the journey. And then I know that you came back to the States and you were like, I want to get involved in this. And you tried kind of a couple different ways to go through other organizations, but there was, you know, sometimes nonprofit work can be tricky. And sometimes people don't really know how to follow through with what the promises they make or financially, they're just not prepared to do what they're supposed to do. So you're like, I'm just going to start a fiscally responsible organization that supports dozens of, of locally run, locally placed, um, human traffic saving organizations around the world. I'm going to, I'm going to do a U.S. hub in order to support all those locally based organizations. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. So I came back and wanted to support some of the stuff I had seen in India and they didn't really have a, a good mechanism in the States. You know, they weren't set up as a U.S. fundraising presence. And, right. and so I couldn't really get money to them. You know, I wasn't prepared to like pack it in a fanny pack and try to like smuggle it over there or yeah. something. And, um, and so I started trying to support some local initiatives and yeah, started hearing this theme of, you know, human trafficking was all over the world. And as I was learning about it, discovering it's the fastest growing criminal enterprise. And, and then I started hearing about all these American organizations trying to recruit Americans to move overseas to go fight human trafficking. And it just, you know, it's not that it's inherently wrong if somebody feels compelled to, to, you know, uproot and, and go to another country and engage right. there in humanitarian work. That's that's great. Right. It's just not super scalable, right? If, if this is the fastest growing criminal enterprise 
and these people have to move and then go to language school and learn the culture and they don't know where it's happening and why. And then if their kid gets malaria, they're probably going to move back to the States for medical treatments or, you know, that if, if in fact, which was sort of proven to be true, if there's already people in country who are giving their lives to serve their community, wouldn't it be way more efficient, way more effective, way more scalable and way more powerful if we could just come alongside of the organizations and, and create that U.S. kind of hub um, that can that can raise the funds and build the build the resources and connect them together internationally. And so it, it was about a four year process from when I went to India to kind of seeing all these trends and seeing how all these things were playing out and getting connected to a bunch of other amazing sort of mom and pop initiatives around the world led by nationals uh, about this four year journey that eventually then finally led to us saying, you know what, nobody's really doing what we think needs to be done. So maybe we should build it. So four years right. after that trip to India, launched Rescue Freedom. Awesome, awesome. So um, you got a you got a small staff working in the Seattle area. Um, some of them are remote, and then yep. you guys are just basically doing all of the administrative back end stuff, so that local people can be literally in the streets, in the trenches, in the rescue homes every day doing the work and they don't have to worry about it. And I think that's beautiful and amazing. My question for you is you and your staff, do you just exist in a perpetual state of brokenheartedness? You know, most of us survive because we can ignore it. And mm -hmm. you every day as part of your job is to be the reporting on children and uh, adults around the world, but children are particularly heartbreaking who are in sex trafficking. Are you guys just heartbroken all the time? And can you just speak to that? Yeah, I think, I mean, the answer is yes and no. In a sense, um, so we have this, this phrase. I remember when we moved into our little office, <clears throat> I, I wanted to put some, you know, inspiring quotes on the wall and things that sort of captured our ethos. Hmm. And I remember my wife was helping me find them and, and she's like, well, what do you, what do you want to, what do you want the wall to say? Like what, what, what kind of quote are we looking for? You know, and I'm thinking like something from mother Teresa or something. And, and I was like, well, the sentiment I want to communicate that I think is what keeps us grounded, that needs to be on the wall when you walk in our office is something to the effect of it's not the injustice that drives us. It's the magnitude of hope. Hmm. And she's like, can I just put that on the wall? I'm like, no, you can't quote me on the wall. She's like, well, we don't quote anybody. Let's just say it. And, and it sort of just, capture the sentiment of, for us, this idea of, yes, the injustice is at times completely overwhelming. And you have to look at the injustice right in the eye. You have to see it. You have to understand it. But it's really not the injustice that drives us. It's the magnitude of hope. And it comes back to that first experience of, you know, I saw the injustice and I just wanted to go home. And then I went to the homes and I met these kids who were thriving and full of hope and joy. And then I wanted to act. It wasn't the injustice that isn't actually what motivated me to act. It it angered me. Uh, it it mobilized a lot of emotion and intensity, but it was it was the fact that I saw that there was hope and I believed that there was something that could be done. So we try, and I, I really encourage the team, even when we travel, we spend significantly more time in the places of hope than in the places of darkness, because it's the only way I think your soul can cope. I mean, you you spend 90 minutes walking through a red light area where exploitation is rampant and and you just feel terrible. I mean, you just feel oppressed, you feel brokenhearted. Um, but then you know you spend you spend an evening at a graduation ceremony for a group of girls who got out of the brothels at the same time and now they're graduating college. Or you get to I got to be a part of one of the girls' weddings that I had known for for eight years since she had come out and being there at her wedding and participating in the wedding ceremony, it's, those are the moments that, that sustain. Um, and so we just have to fixate sort of disproportionately on those, on those components. That's great. Um, I, this is, uh, I was going to say something and I'm, if I'm out of line, you just tell me I'm out of line, Jeremy. I mean, you and I are good enough friends. You can do that, but there's there are people who look at you and they go, who the hell are you? Like, here's an issue that's that's radically affecting marginalized people around the world. And you walk out of your safe little small town background and you think you think you can help. You can what it's so condescending for you to say that I can help these people. 
Mm -hmm. and uh, these people that, you know, that live far away or whatever. And what I want to say, and, and from our conversations, one of the things I love about you is you're like, I can't help them. Like it's their people that can help them. Mm -hmm. What I'm good at is networking and building systems and trying to figure out how to get stuff done and doing research. You I mean, you're an Oxford grad. Like I know how to do research. I know how to figure things out. I know how to write a report. Like these are things I'm good at. I'm going to stay in my lane so they can stay in their lane because I realize that in a sense, I don't want to be condescending to these issues. Mm -hmm. Am I speaking accurately? I mean, I know I'm, I'm making a large statement. Yeah, no, I think, you know, for me, a, a lot of it, and I, I, one of my favorite things is seeing, I think one of the most catalytic things that I've been able to be a part of is seeing when survivors who have come out are the ones driving the vision and saying, you know, we started initially focusing on that care side of it uh, because I was meeting people who were in their country saying, you know, these are these these kids are in my village. And you know, right. one of my favorite programs was launched by a nurse who just started going into the red light area to provide free medical care because the the STDs were so rampant. And and so she started going in and then she just started building relationship. And these women said, started saying, will you get my kids out? Like I, 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 you come here to take care of me, but my daughter is being groomed for this. Will you get her out? And so she launched it with her friends. Right. And it was her serving her community and coming alongside of them. But what what then happens is these survivors are the ones that start. So that home is a great example where the, they still operate this medical clinic. And one of the girls who grew up in that brothel, whose mom helped get her out, ended up going to nursing school and now comes back to serve in the medical clinic so that she can go into these brothels where she's known because they're like, wait, you look familiar. She's like, yeah, I grew up in brothel 42. You know, my mom was here. My aunt was here because her whole genealogy had been exploited. And suddenly this girl that's known in the community is now a nurse. And when wow. she says to the other kids, hey, there's hope for you too. It's right. impossible not to believe her. Like if some right. stranger shows up and says, hey, you know, I'm a white kid from farm town in USA and says like, hey, there's hope for you. They're like, who the heck do you think you are? And, right. you know, the last person that told him there was hope was probably their exploiter who promised him something and then didn't deliver. So right. if I show up, my words are meaningless. But when right. a survivor shows up who's known in the community and who's been there or when a survivor goes back to the village where the girls are being trafficked from and says, to the families, hey, this was my story. They promised me a job. And I know that's what they're telling you is the future for your daughters, but don't believe them. That So that's what I love about our model is we get to find the people who are the most credible, who are the best. And we get to come along and say, how can we encourage you? How can we support you? We don't want you to feel like you have to fight this battle alone because only you can do what you can do. Like, you know, I, again, I'll, I can never do it, but there are things I can do here in the States with resources and, and connections that they can't. And if I can just mobilize my little, little pocket of skill sets to actually turn them loose to be the most incredible leaders that they are, then I feel like I'm doing my part. Okay. Now here's here's another way that you're a walking contradiction. So you're running this this nonprofit, and then simultaneously you're the co-founder of uh, an adventure company, an adventure organization. Uh, and right now, right now, I mean, the Pilgrim Lost community we're we're, we're big about a life of adventure and meaning. Uh, people listening, they've all they've all gone on long treks or many of them have gone on long treks walking across Spain or different parts of the world or doing the Pacific Coast Trail or whatever it might be. They love we love that stuff. We're one of the one of the themes of our of our community is just trying trying to get outside more, trying to be more healthy, trying to be more connected. And you create an organization that helps people like go on these physical adventures. And where the heck did that come from? Yeah. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, I grew up in the foothills of the Cascade Mountains, you know, about 45 minutes from Seattle. So for me, the mountains were formative in my life and childhood. And I was also fortunate enough to grow up in an area. There was a, a publicly owned um, like 70 acre wetland behind our house growing up that there were no houses that could really access it. It was kind of like I think the city owned it and it was in between kind of the the, the little highway there. And so no one else could really access the 70 acre wetland with, I mean, there was a salmon stream and a beaver pond. And for some reason, as a kid, whenever things were hard, I would just go and walk back there and just take time to be alone. And, and I just, I mean, there's something for me that was always deeply therapeutic about the sound of a stream and mm. the leaves rustling in the wind. And, 
and my my parents in small town that you know they they would let me go out there all day and I'd take a little book of matches and make a little fire and just sit by the stream by a little fire and think and reflect and um uh, and so the outdoors has always been a, a huge part of my life but also growing up in Seattle you know, we all grow up staring at Mount Rainier. And so early on, I remember at one point, my neighbor, when I was just a kid, he was climbing Mount Rainier and I went over and watched him pack his backpack. And I was watching him strap his ice axe on the side and his crampons. And as a kid, I mean, he might have, he might, might as well have been like, you know, Buzz Aldrin flying to the moon. I just thought this was the coolest, most amazing, kind of magical, mysterious, <laughs> oh, you know, great. like Frodo Baggins heading out on this epic adventure. And so, like then and there as a little kid, I was like, one day I'll climb Mount Rainier. And so eventually I got into mountain climbing. Um, so when I came back from that that trip to India that I mentioned and was trying to figure out, OK, I got to do something. I want to help. I want to be a part of this. I, you know, I was not that far out of college, didn't have a lot of resources. Most of my friends were not making much money. Um, this was in 2008. So, you know, the, the the markets were a little different back in 2008 and 2009 than they are now. Uh, and so we were trying to figure out what to do. And, and a few of these friends had asked me if I would lead them on a trip up Mount Rainier, some other Seattle area, you know, kids who had grown up with that as a bucket list. And I was the only one they knew that climbed it. And so me and a friend were working on this trip anyway. And, and so we decided to bring along six other buddies. And it just so happened the only time we could get permits for Mount Rainier, because you have to have a climbing permit to do the mountain, was on the 4th of July. So we booked the 4th of July weekend. We were going to summit over the 4th of July. And two weeks before we left, I remember we were doing our last training hike and I got this email from a friend that was doing like a race for the cure two cancer weeks. marathon two, two weeks, weeks before. Yeah. Okay. So 14 days before the climb, we're doing our last training thing and then kind of take the last 14 weeks, you know, not do anything too physically or 14 days to, to do anything too physically strenuous. And, and so we we're driving out to, to go to the trailhead for this last little training hike. And I get this email and this, a buddy's doing a race for the cure cancer marathon. And it's like this light bulb went on of like, well, running marathons doesn't have anything to do with cancer. So if you could run a marathon to raise money for cancer, why don't we just turn our climb into a fundraising climb? And I, I hadn't heard about it. I mean, others are doing all kinds of stuff like that now, but at the time I had never heard of anything like that. I was just like, well, I bet we could get our, you know, friends and families, moms and grandmas to like donate $50 in support of us climbing this mountain and it'll raise some awareness about human trafficking. And so I pitched it to the guys at the trailhead. I said, hey guys, what if we, we got 14 days. What if we try to raise $14,410, which is $1 for every vertical foot of Mount Rainier in 14 days. And we'll, and we'll put it towards helping kids get out of exploitation. And the guys were like, well, sure. I mean, we'll follow your lead if, if, if you want to build it. So that night I set the most like basic little WordPress website and another buddy was trying to figure out, you know, how, okay, how do we, who do we donate? And we found a local nonprofit that we could team up with because the India one didn't have a way to raise money for them. And so we threw this thing together and it just took off. And in two weeks we raised about 25 grand for this climb and people wow. started, one, one of the guys climbing was a pastor and and he learned about it through participating with us. And he said, hey, will you come and just speak to our church about human trafficking? People need to know what's going on. Let's 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 learn about it. And and I remember thinking, well, I actually don't know anything about human trafficking other than I met these amazing kids and it was really bad. And now there's amazing hope. Like, that's about all I know. And and then a few other friends were reached out and said, hey, when's the next climb for captives? That's what we, we called it. We didn't know what to call it. We threw this name on there on the website because we needed a domain. And. So then all of a sudden people are like, hey, when's the next climb for captives? Can I do one? And so then we did it again. And then more people were like, hey, can I can I get in on a climb for captives? Amazing. And so we kept doing it and people kept donating. And so we started calling it adventure philanthropy because that's sort of all we felt like we had to give was our adventures. We didn't have a lot of money, uh, but we love to adventure. And what I saw was, one there was something really profound that happened with the group of people that came together. I mean, you know, this is like, there's something about when you spend time with other people out in the wild, you know, not just necessarily on like a walk in the city park, which, you know, that's nice, but there's something when you're away, like you're away from the sound of any civilization, you're out of your comfort zone. You've, you've out pushed, of zone. yeah, right. you've, you've pushed past that point where you can just, you know, easily turn around and get a, go get a, a sandwich on the corner, you know, you're out, you're away. And people put their guard down. People start to reflect. People don't have cell reception. They, 
you know, ama amazing things happen. So what we started seeing was people were having these incredibly profound experiences because they were out in nature. And then you add to the fact this knowledge that somehow by doing this, not only is our life changing, but other lives are changing as a result. Like it almost felt too good to be true. I mean, I still have these moments. It, privilege is not the right word where it's, mm. it just feels like something, something even bigger than privilege, right? Like it, how could, how oh, could yeah. me, like, how could I get to do something I already love doing that feels in and of itself, like one of the greatest gifts that I can experience as a human is to like enjoy right. the wonder of creation. That's like that, that in and of itself at times feels too good to be true when there's a beautiful sunset or, you know, a crisp mountain breeze or, and then you throw onto it. And then somehow by us doing this and inviting our community, somebody's life on the other side of the world is going to be radically changed forever. Like I don't even have words to describe the, you know, that it just felt too good to be true. And so this group just sort of bonded over this sense of awe and wonder, not just about the shared experience, but this knowledge of how humbling it was, how privileged it felt to get to do something so significant that also was just so, so personally fulfilling. I love it. I love it. And um, Climb for Captives is now an organization, climbforcaptives.com. And uh, any anybody can do it for anything. You can go on there and build a campaign, right? You can go on and just decide we're gonna go, we're gonna do a fifty mile hike, the twelve of us, and all on the hike, we're gonna raise money for our favorite thing. Yeah, it doesn't have to be human trafficking, right? They just this is our organization. We want to raise money for. You don't have to wait for race for the cure to do the administration. You can kind of do your own on your. Is that right? Am I correct? Yeah. So what we what ended up happening over time was, you know, I had sort of rescue freedom and climb for captives running in parallel. And more and more people started asking, like, well, do I have to climb? Like, can I can I do a long through hike? And I'm like, of right. course, like, uh, you know, do do whatever this idea of sort of use your adventures for good. You know, this adventure philanthropy kind of concept. And for us, kind of this right. idea of like, get outside invite people into adventure and go change the world. And, and so it sort of expanded. There was one of our team members, she's on staff with us now, but a number of years ago, she, she doesn't like to climb, but she loves to do these long grueling through hikes. And so she started this thing at a time called it freedom hikers. And, and so now there's sort of this larger, uh, I mean, so Climb for Captives is still sort of promoting as a platform where we tell people, hey, if you're climbing a mountain, um, here's how you can turn it into a campaign. We'll provide you the tools. Um, there's now guide services that offer Climb for Captives guided climbs. So somebody that's wanted to climb but never knows how, they can just sign up. Uh, we've been working with a company called Mountain Madness, which is one of the, the biggest and kind of best mountain guide organizations out there where they just love the climb for captives concept and, and teaming up with rescue freedom. And so they'll do these guided climbs where you can just sign up and book a, a climb and then turn it into a climb for captives. And so it really has turned into all over the country. I mean, I think last summer there were over 400 people doing hikes, climbs through hikes, yoga retreats. I mean, it, it's just keeps rippling further and further. And this idea, you know, one of the mantras that kind of caught on in that community um, that came from a, a, a friend of mine was this idea of how do we do what we love to fight what we hate? That this idea of we hate the fact that women and children are being exploited, but we can combat the darkness with the things we love. I'm, um, yeah, I, I get on this podcast. I, you know, build the website for Pilgrim Lost. We have these conversations around pilgriming as a community. Um, I, I am, I'm a little ashamed that, you know, we have these conversations about personal wholeness and self-care. We have these conversations about go on these walks with your friends, your family members, and really just have it be an intense bonding experience. We talk a lot about meeting other pilgrims along the way and the gift of friendship and how much friendship can change your life. And you can change theirs, the power of the unexpected communal moment. Talk mm -hmm. about that a lot. But we have we have never, ever gotten into the space of could our adventurous heart, this desire to see the world, to experience new things, that this could actually be something where simultaneously we would be touching marginalized people 
hmm. around the world or marginalized people in our communities back home or whatever. We've never had this conversation, Jeremy. I'm, I'm so disappointed that we haven't. And then you come on. So what would you say to us? I mean, you got, you got literally people listening to this who have walked thousands of miles. And, um, can you just like encourage us or give us a little, a little insight in this area? Well, I, I love that, that your community is coming into this conversation with the history that you have, because I, I would venture to say there's probably few communities out there that understand the deeper value of, of being outdoors, of, of spending time in the wild with others. And you know, for me, one of the things I've found is I, I get often just as excited about the transformation that happens in somebody's life when they participate in something like this as I do about the impact on the ground. In other words, if, you know, we've had, we've had moments on hillsides with people who they weren't trafficked, but they felt hopeless in their life. They felt like they had no connection and no community. They were you know, they, they felt like they, life wasn't worth living or, you know, purposelessness. And, and that's a bleak and heavy and dark place to be. And I get just as excited about somebody finding connection and purpose and belonging, like experiencing a full and beautiful life. That makes me ex like, I, I celebrate that. And, and I also get excited when somebody finds freedom from exploitation. And so the, the amazing thing I think with your community is one, they would understand that the power is not just in the impact, the power is in what you're inviting people into. Um, and they understand that some people might not even be open to this idea of a difficult experience that they don't, they don't know what they're saying no to. I mean, I've had people say like, I hate being cold, I'm never gonna do it. And people who they see the cause and they're like, man, you know what? That's enough to push me over my own hurdles of why I have been resistant to this. And with some of these people who I really care about, I'm looking at being like, oh, you have no idea what this is going to do for you. And I'm so excited for you to experience your flourishing as well. But it's the cause that gets them to get over their barriers, over their fears, over those hurdles. Um, and it's this sort of beautiful unity of uh, that. It's not just our sacrifice of, you know, getting over the asking for money or asking our friends to support us in this. Like there's sacrifice. But what I love is oftentimes we see sort of giving and generosity and humanitarian work is like somebody over here has to sacrifice in order to help somebody over there. And it's like this trade off, this exchange of like, I got to give up something so that you can have something. And this is, this is like a, the pie just grows. Everybody wins. You get to come and be a part of something beautiful and somebody gets to have their life change forever. So this community, I think that's what I would say to you is, you already know what you're inviting people into from an experience standpoint. You know that you get to invite them into not just a sacrifice for a cause that matters. It's not a guilt trip. It's not some heavy hearted, heavy handed emotional manipulation. Like here's this heavy, watch this video that's gonna make you cry and then I'm gonna make right. you feel guilty. This is, this community probably understands better than most. Like this is inviting in people into something that will change their life and along the way, they're going to discover it actually changed somebody else's as well. So you get it. You know the power. And so for some of those people in your world that you just know this kind of trekking and adventure would change their life, but they've been hesitant, this is another opportunity to invite them into a different problem, a different challenge that they're going to take on. But along the way, they'll discover the thing that you all have loved all along as well. And what a powerful thing for a community to do together like a group of people that already know each other. Maybe they don't know each other. Great. You know, maybe it's a company or uh, maybe it's a, a faith community or whatever to get together and go, let's go, let's go on this adventure together. Let's, let's, I mean, here I'm in Portland, let's climb up top of Mount hood. And in the process, yeah. let's, let's figure out a way to send some, send some, some dollars to something that matters. You know, uh, it's really great. Um, one more thing I want your advice on Jeremy uh, and I could do this all day, but one of the other things we talk about, uh, on Pilgrim Lost fairly regularly is when you're on pilgrimage, specifically like on the community of Santiago, there's this weird sensation that happens that doesn't happen back home often is when you're walking around, when you're on the community, you just assume that every other person that you encounter is your friend. Like hmm. the moment you meet them. Oh, I love you that. Just, because you're both on pilgrimage together, you just assume that like, you know, it's like going to a conference, you know, like, 
we're all into anime and we go to an anime <laughs> conference and I like everybody because we're all into the same thing, you know? So you're on pilgrimage. You just kind of assume that we're all in the same story. Hmm. Like, oh my gosh. But when I walk around Portland, my tendency is to go, we're in different stories. That person is different than me. I should, I, it might be, it would be rude to say hello or be, or I would be going out of my way or be awkward where I'm walking on the Camino. I'm like, I say hello to everybody. Cause we're all in the same story. We're all, does that make sense? That concept? A hundred percent. I think I've never thought about it this way. I think that's why I, I have this resistance to people that hike with like AirPods in or like listening. But the worst is listening to like music on their speakerphone in the woods when they're hiking, <laughs> because and I think I, I've never thought about it this way, but it's like the way you articulated that, like we're in the same story. It's like, I feel like as they're passing me, they're not in my story. They're not making eye contact and saying, howdy, as you pass, right? They're, they're telling you, you're not in my story. Yeah. Right? That's very I, dehumanizing. It, totally. And so it always feels like, like, it just feels like this, it's like, you know, it's like the curtain comes down in a play and you're reminded that it, that it's that it's acting or something. It's like, right. you know, the, the props fail and you see a rope swing through the scene and it just like... Right. Um, but I, I, the way you articulated that sense of being in the story together, I, I love that because that, yeah, that frames that, that experience for me. So with trafficked people around the world, how are we in the same story? Yeah. Um, well, kind of to come back to what I said about and, and what you all know of, um, you know, the, the things that the, the reflections that you have, the things you discover about yourself, the way you confront your pain and your wounds and your brokenness in nature. And in uh, one of the things that I've seen over and over again is at the end of the day, um, the, the goal of, of fighting human trafficking is not just to get somebody out of a situation of exploitation, because if they get out and they believe that they have no dignity no self-worth that nobody could ever love them because of what's been done to them. That's not a real victory for that person, right? A lot of times those, those people, if they don't have something they're being welcomed into, and if they don't start to discover their value, uh, and that usually has to happen in the context of Kim says about you and who you are, um, that, that speaks to their infinite value and their dignity and their equality. Um, and what I've found is in doing these types of adventures over the years, of people coming into it thinking, oh, I'm here to help set someone else free. And what they discover as they find connection and community is the areas that they're not free themselves. Like at the end of the day, every human, whether you were grew, grew up in a context of, you know, addiction or pain or, or a broken home or, or loss or trafficking, every human deep down, we're longing for the same thing. We're, we're all the same. We long to be loved unconditionally. We love to be known and seen. We love to be connected and in relationship and to know peace and rest and not fear. And at the end of the day, we're all in this together, whether you've been, you know, again, whether you're a trafficking survivor or not. And so what I love is as people start to discover that they think they're there just for someone else's freedom, and then they start to find their own. And in that way, we are all the same. We're all longing for the same things. We're no different. Um, we all long to be, to experience those things. And I think we can experience them in the wild in really special and unique ways, especially in the context of community. Your organization is called Rescue Freedom International, uh, rescuefreedom.org. Um, Jeremy, we've talked about uh, climbing for captives, this, this adventure philanthropy idea. There are other ways for people to stay connected or to, or to support you if they, or to learn more about human trafficking around the world that you would recommend. Like, can you just give us a little resource guide or a little? Yeah, absolutely. The we website that you? you gave. Yeah. The website you gave rescuefreedom.org is a great place to start. Um, our social media at rescue freedom. Um, we're on kind of all the, all the various platforms. Um, and part of the reason why, as I mentioned at the beginning, that human trafficking is a man-made problem. And so it, it can be solved with man-made solutions. And so what we, we try really hard to do is actually put out resources, you know, our social media and our website. It's not just about how do we raise money. It's how do we educate people so they stop perpetuating the issue, so they know how to recognize vulnerabilities in their community. You know, there was, there was a girl from my kid's school that was trafficked in the last year um, from a quiet, pretty suburban little school. Um, and, and so as people start to realize how this is happening, 
the type of kids that are targeted, um, that people can start to be more aware, they can be more engaged, and they can learn how they can actually play a role in solving this man-made issue. So yeah, if you join us, that's a great way, a great next step. And then obviously, um, if there's resources we can provide, you're always welcome to, to turn your adventure into a uh, an effort to set people free from trafficking, but even taking our resources. And if there's another cause that you care about, you know, even a local charity or nonprofit you're connected with, they can easily look at what we do. We're not secretive about what we do it and how we do it and how we encourage people to engage their community and the, the tools they put out there. So if it's not us, find somebody, find somebody to lean into for impact and purpose uh, to connect what you already love to fight an injustice that plagues our world today. So. Thank you. Jeremy, is there anything you haven't had a chance to say that you would like to say? Well, uh, for me, I'm I'm thrilled in this in this day and age, uh, in all the hustle and bustle. When I feel like I I hear more people talking about the metaverse and how we can accelerate our online existence, I'm just thrilled to know that there are people taking taking a deep breath, stepping away from all of that to reconnect with themselves and each other. And, and the created world and, and the beauty that's out there. And so keep keep inviting people into it. I, I truly believe that that amazing things happen. Uh, for me, I often say amazing things happen in the mountains because uh, that's the mountains are where I, where I come alive. But amazing thing happens happens on river bottoms and valleys as well. But so keep inviting people out there. Keep telling the story. People need it. I think people need it more than ever because perhaps we're the most disconnected uh, from the natural world. Than we've ever been before. And, and I don't see that, that changing, unfortunately, anytime soon. So keep it up. Thank you, my friend, everybody. That is Jeremy Valorand. He's with Rescue Freedom International and Climb for Captives. And uh, we're so thankful you're here. Thanks for speaking into our community and um, hopefully opening our eyes to an even more, like even greater layers of meaning that we can bring in as we attempt to live this pilgrim life. This is Pilgrim Lost. I'm Tony Kriz. Uh, please go to pilgrimlost.com. Continue to follow us. If you can go to our Patreon page and support us, if this um, podcast means anything to you, we'd really appreciate it. Thank you so much, everybody. And thank you for getting lost with us.